Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IADI web webinar on inclusive development with Professor Joyita Gupta. I'm Rowena, and I'm going to moderate today's discussion. Some of you may be new to IADI, so I will give you a little introduction. IADI stands for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes, and it's a Europe wide network of researchers and students in all fields of development. And IADI promotes the exchange of information amongst members to strengthen networks and influence policymakers. This IADI virtual dialogue series actually predates the movement of all webinars and discussions going on live, online with COVID. And it has been engaging researchers and practitioners from all over the world who bring different ideas to development thinking. Before going into this webinar, some technical points. Professor Gupta will present for about 30 minutes and at the end of her presentation, we will then have time for comments and discussions and questions. Now, just a little bit to introduce our speaker today, because Professor Gupta has a remarkable number of strings to her bow and is involved in many important negotiations and research programs shaping our world. She is Professor of Environment and Development in the Global South at the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research at the University of Amsterdam. And she's also at the IHE Delft Institute for Water Education. She was the lead author in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which won the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. In between all of that, she has published extensively and is on the editorial board of many journals. She's on the scientific steering committee of many uh, international programs, including the Global Water Systems Project and Earth System Governance. And today she's going to present to us about why we can no longer address development without taking environmental issues into account. So over to you, Professor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about inclusive development. And I'm looking at some theoretical explorations of this concept. So the question is, why inclusive development? After that, I'm going to follow up by looking at why social inclusiveness, why ecological inclusiveness, why relational inclusiveness. These are the three dimensions of inclusive development. And then I move on to discuss how inclusiveness redefines development before drawing a conclusion. So if you look at inclusive development, one reason why we want to look at social inclusion is because historically, development benefits have not trickled down adequately to the lower levels in society. It has remained concentrated at the top. If you look at the environment, we have something that is called environmental utilization space or eco space. And because this is limited, this has led to growing conflicts over control over the space and hence the need to look at ecological inclusion. And if you look at decision making processes, these have privileged some people over others, even the so called participatory processes. And that is why inclusion must also focus on relational issues. And finally, I'm going to argue that inclusion implies redefining development, including the role of technology. So if you look at inclusive development, the question you might have is why? Why not sustainable development? Now, if you look at sustainable development, essentially it's about the economy, the environment and society. But there is a tendency to focus much more on the economy because it's valued in economic terms, in monetary terms. So in 2007, the economy was worth 58 trillion US dollars. But in that same year, if you had actually calculated the cost of the environment or the value of the environment, that would have come to 125 trillion US dollars, which is more than twice what the economy was worth. And if you look at how environmental damage impacts on society, that's almost a welfare loss of about $20 trillion. But because the environment and society are not valued in monetary terms, and it's not part of the monetary exchange, it doesn't play an important role in sustainable development. 
Hence, if you take inclusive development, we focus on the environment, society, and relational approaches, and we use these three approaches to look at the economy. Now, social inclusiveness is quite clear to probably most of you, so I'll just briefly run through a few reasons. First, there's growing income and wealth inequality, and that itself is problematic. It leads to a sort of gentrification of rich pockets within a world of poverty. We also see the growing inequality implies the impoverishment of people and people are unable to live a life of dignity that it violates human rights. Increasingly in a neoliberal context, even social services are now subject to cost recovery principles and this further impoverishes people and inequality and poverty are also linked to a breakdown of peace and possibly to conflict. That's quite straightforward. Let's look at ecological inclusiveness. Why is this important? Well, as I mentioned earlier, ecosystems provide very valuable services. Not only do they provide services to the world's rich, 70% of the world's poor depend directly on ecosystems for their lives and their livelihoods. And in fact, the bulk of global biodiversity is protected by a very small group of people who are the indigenous people and the local communities. Today, ecosystems are very badly damaged. This is related to what we call the planetary boundaries narrative. And this damage to ecosystems is also causing huge damage on human life. And this perhaps and has an impact of 10 million deaths annually and billions are affected in their health. Let me explain. So when you look at the ecosystem around you, uh, some people will talk about ecosystem services and some people will now talk about nature's contributions to people. It's the same thing, except that the first one is a little bit controversial because some people think it leads you to commodify these services. So it's better to talk about nature's contributions and to focus on not commodifying nature. Essentially, what we are talking about is the supporting services of nature, which leads nature to ensure that nutrients are recycled. So phosphorus, nitrogen. It's also about how our soils are formed and the fertility of the soils are ensured. Nature also provides us regulating services. So here we are looking at issues such as flood regulation. So mangroves protect coastlines from flooding. But you have other regulating services such as the hydrological cycle or the climate cycle, climate uh, system. Then, of course, we have provisioning services. Nature provides us the apples and the food that we eat, the fish that we eat. It provides us wood for our houses or for our energy. And of course, nature provides us cultural services. So these cultural services can include, for example, our ability to enjoy uh, nature for recreation or the fact that we see nature sometimes as a god or perhaps that we use nature as an inspiration for our science. And these have been clustered slightly differently within the concept of nature's contributions to people as material contributions, which are provisioning and cultural, non-material contributions, which are the supporting and cultural services and regulating contributions, which also can have a cultural component. We're all extremely dependent on nature. I mean, if you just look at bees, bees are being threatened massively by our pesticides and chemicals, but they're absolutely essential for every flower that blooms or every fruit that you eat. Now, when we talk about the world, and I'm just dividing it for simplicity purposes into rich and poor, well, the world of the rich, which is perhaps the world of the formal economy, it depends on extraction of resources, on the use of these resources for the production of goods and services, such as telephones. And it also looks at the way these goods are then consumed and finally disposed. So for the rich, we are indirectly 
because sometimes we don't directly have a contact with nature, but we're indirectly dependent on nature for our production of goods and resources. And if you look at it from the perspective of those who are not part of the formal economy, those who are poor, they benefit directly from nature's contributions to people. So they benefit from clean air, fertile soils, clean water, firewood, a stable climate, etc. But suppose now we damage this. Suppose the air is polluted, or the water is polluted, or the soil is no longer fertile or the climate changes, as is currently happening, then this means that there are reduced nature's contributions to people. And this means that they have to go out and buy these goods and services in the market. But they are poor. And so by definition, it is much more difficult for them to go and buy these services. Now, when we talk about boundaries, we are talking about local planetary boundaries and global planetary boundaries. A local boundary is essentially when you pollute your local area so much that you cannot breathe. So that's urban pollution or urban water pollution. When we talk about planetary boundaries, we are talking about those issues that become extremely problematic at the global scale. So for example, biodiversity loss. We are in the midst of the sixth worst extinction event. And this implies that we are losing massive amounts of biodiversity, which are absolutely vital for the functioning of our biogeochemical processes at the global level. Climate change is another global problem, which has a global manifestation, but it also manifests itself at local level and has many impacts on humans. But we also have problems with nitrogen and phosphorus that are vital for various other processes as well as food production. The problem is today, we are using one and a half times our Earth annually. And this basically means that we are overdrawing from the Earth. Now, if you look at the environmental degradation that we are causing, what kind of impact does this have on human health? This was studied by the Global Environment Outlook in its report, Healthy Planet, Healthy People. And basically what you see is that an unhealthy planet is responsible for about 25% of all health impacts worldwide. And then if you look at disasters, over a 10 year period disasters kills 0.7 million people and affected 1.7 billion people at a cost of 1.4 trillion US dollars. If you look at air pollution, air pollution causes 7 million people to die, much more health damage. And this amounts to a welfare loss of about $5 trillion per annum. Land, when it gets degraded, can affect 3.2 billion people, almost half the world's population. And this can amount to a loss of about four to $20 trillion per annum. Water also has impacts on people up to causing up to 1.4 million deaths. So basically what we are seeing is that a, a planet which has degraded has enormous impacts on human health. And this is why you cannot look at social inclusiveness without looking at the ecological dimensions of it as well. Now, another point with respect to ecological inclusiveness is the concept of shrinking ecospace. Worldwide, we have limited land and we have limited fresh water at a given moment of time. So this basically means that there is greater and greater competition for land and water. And you will find a lot of new articles coming out on the issues of land grabbing and water grabbing as a consequence. If you look at issues like strategic metals and minerals, let's take um, rare earths that are vital for many of the modern technologies that we use for our telephones, our computers. These are also in limited quantity. And as you extract more and more, it's available less and less. This also increases the competition we have in society over access rights to these minerals and metals.
And then we have a limited carrying capacity. So this means that there's a limit to how much we can pollute the earth. So a key example of that is there's a limit to how much greenhouse gases we can emit because this is going to lead to exacerbating the current climate emergency. But in smaller lakes also, there's a limit to how much the lake can clean up the pollution that you cause over there. This shrinking inclusiveness is critical for our understanding of the way in which governance patterns work. Works. And this brings me to my discussion of relational inclusiveness. And I'm going to discuss that in relation to ecological issues, in relation to social issues, and then focus a little bit on the role of technology. So when you have a shrinking eco space, so fixed land, fixed water at a given moment of time, but rising global demand for land and water, what happens? If you are in a neoliberal context, neoliberal capitalist context, basically they feel that these resources should then be commodified and privatized and their distribution should be allocated by markets. And this process often takes place also within confidential contracts. And when there are problems with these contracts, because it's confidential, nobody else finds out about it. And even the arbitration around these confidential contracts remains secret. So let us assume, for example, that water is a limited resource. It falls within the jurisdiction of various countries. But within a neoliberal capitalist world, it is possible to engage in water grabbing across the border to buy water in other parts of the world for various productive processes. And this is what is currently happening, which is called water grabbing or land grabbing. If you then look at the next option that we have when there is a shrinking environmental space, that's through the notion of hegemonic power. This is when countries start to say, I don't care about the rest of the world. I'm going to focus on my country first. And this will resonate with some of you because you've heard that recently in relation to the United States. But the US expressed this term in the words of Mr. Trump, but many other countries feel the same way. This is hegemonic power. And when you have hegemonic power, you're basically trying to see how you can use the discourses of sovereignty or securitization to enable you to not share your resources with other countries. And if the resources are available in other countries, then you're trying to quickly make bilateral or plurilateral agreements with those countries to access their resources. So this is what we are seeing from the perspective of hegemonic power. Another way to deal with scarcity of resources is through polycentricity. In the polycentric discourse, we don't focus on markets as much as we focus on enabling multiple actors in different parts of the world to address problems. This focuses on self-management, on experimentation, and does not recognize a hierarchy of processes. The last type of narrative that can be used to govern a shrinking eco-space is the sustainable development narrative, which you can see right now with the sustainable development goals, which really focuses on trying to come to some kind of universal intergovernmental approach. And perhaps in the long run, we want to move towards global rule of law and global constitutionalism, where no country and no CEO or no bank is above the system, is above the law. Now, when you look at the issue of social space, even the social space is shrinking worldwide. If you look at the literature, it talks a lot about the shrinking 
civic space that we have in many parts of the world where people are getting squeezed where NGOs and civic society are being controlled by the state. Now, here, let us talk about it also in terms of the neoliberal capitalist narrative. This narrative is focusing on trying to convince the government to deregulate, trying to convince the government to become lean and to reduce the role of the state in the provision of merit goods, merit goods such as drinking water supply and sanitation services, straight lights, education, health care, public health care. So basically, they're trying to focus on public-private partnerships in this arena. But what you often find is that this might lead to capital accumulation via dispossession. So basically, the neoliberals are trying to deregulate, promote deregulation, which enables them to acquire more and more capital and more and more resources and more and more control over labor markets. So for example, if you deregulate labor, then the amount of salaries you have to pay or the need to have permanent jobs decreases. And this becomes especially possible in a technological world. I'll come to that. If you then look at hegemonic power, well, within the notion of state relationships, you have this notion of center periphery, where the center dominates the control over the social space and the periphery gets uh, marginalized. And if you look at hegemonic discourses at human level, then we're talking really about discrimination. Discrimination perhaps between men and women, uh, men and other genders, indigenous communities. So it's basically about who to include and who to exclude. And especially when you have a shortage of resources, there's a strong tendency to focus on excluding others from accessing those resources. And then, of course, in the polycentric governance space, we allow everyone to make their own rules regarding labor laws or regarding poverty control or regarding rules with respect to how society deals with each other. And then you have the sustainable development approach, which tries to look at universal intergovernmentalism and again tries to find certain common narratives to address the social space. And in all this, technology plays a very important role. So let's just take, for example, technology in a neoliberal capitalist world. It, of course, is very, very important for all of us to live better lives, but it also enables somebody to control resources. So the guys who are in charge of building dams then start to control who gets access to the water. The guys who control the irrigation facilities control who gets access to water. Today, increasingly, you're finding that individuals can also, in a neoliberal capitalist world, control data. They can control big data and use this information from telephones and GPS to understand what is happening in society to market their products. If you look at hegemonic power, well, increasingly, we find that states are making deals with the neoliberal capitalists to control data, to monitor society also through algorithms and you're seeing that also now with the use of apps on COVID-19 but there are many other ways to control society through this new use of technology. In a polycentric governance process basically you argue that anybody can, con uh, can control these processes and the problem over here from my perspective is that I think in a polycentric process, there's a very big risk that the rich will control more than the poor. And then we have the sustainable development transformative process, which in theory has the potential to try to control these kinds of technologies. But don't forget, these technologies also enable the movement of money worldwide. So it enables also tax avoidance and evasion. It also enables employment of people worldwide so you don't have to follow your national labor laws and so this really also creates all kinds of problems for us and the current sustainable development goals do not yet address these kinds of issues adequately.
Now, in my perspective, I think there is a space for neoliberal approaches and markets, but it must be within a rule-based narrative. And I think it's okay for states to say we are sovereign entities, but again, it must be within a rule-based narrative. And I think that's also true for polycentric approaches, but in my universe, I'm trying to move towards discourses that really focus on protecting humans, on protecting the ecology, and on making procedures that enable us to work better with each other. And in all this, of course, don't forget we live in an unequal world. And in this unequal world, it's possible for the rich to subvert governance. So the rich subvert governance, for example, by focusing only on financial disruption or economic disruption, but they don't really focus on social and ecological disruption quite as much. They often may accept our goals and principles, but they may not implement it. So they won't put the money that's needed to implement these goals and principles. They may also implement them within dominant frameworks. They may use trade contract and investment law to sabotage some of these goals and principles or technologies or incoherent financial flows or simply use pacification strategies like pro-poor policies to divert attention from pro-rich strategies. Let me give you an example. If you're talking about water, which we need to survive as humans, but water is also part of the ecosystems, but in a socially and in ecologically inclusive world, we need to share water between people, between countries, and also between people and nature. And we need to make sure that there is no harm to nature or to people. And human rights are observed. However, in an Ecologically and socially exclusive world, water is used to promote economic growth. And then you have other variations where you have either social inclusiveness or ecological inclusiveness, but not both. And in all this, we get a combination of socio-ecological disruption. If you look at the SDGs, on paper, they're quite good if they're implemented within the spirit of the SDGs, they will also perhaps meet social and ecological inclusiveness. But if the SDGs are implemented in a neoliberal context, they won't. And ditto for if they're implemented in an inclusive growth model or in a green growth model. And this will still us, bring us to socio-ecological disruption. And this brings me to the issue of what does inclusiveness mean for development? Now, from a social perspective, if markets concentrate income and wealth, in the rich, this will exacerbate inequality. If you have lean states that cannot provide social services or public health, you will have inequality. If you have public-private partnerships, this may not solve the problems of the people in achieving social goods and services. In my view, GDP is a faulty indicator because it measures, av measures averages, not inequality. And so for me, sharing has to be organized through clear post-growth rules. If you look at the ecology, then what you find is that there are not enough resources for a linear society which takes resources and throws resources. This will also exacerbate inequality. There are technological limits to a circular economy, which will also exacerbate inequality. GDP is, in my view, again, here a faulty indicator because it does not measure ecological damage. And so again, for me, sharing resources has to be organized through clear post-growth rules. And of course, one may want to talk about the haves and the have-nots. So there's this whole dialogue about post-capitalism and capitalism. And many feel that this virtual world will create a post-capitalist world, which will, of course, empower people. But my understanding is that what will happen is that there will be a large community of have-nots who do not have the resources, the energy, the sinks, the electromagnetic spectrum, do not have the skills to control cyberspace or biological, physical, chemical technologies. They do not or they lose control over their emotional space because they put it onto Facebook or whatever. 
And essentially what ultimately happens is they may even lose their jobs because technologies replace their jobs through uh, various processes, including through algorithms. So I have a feeling that apart from the nerds who may be able to benefit from this without being rich in themselves, there will be a huge community of people who will become have-nots in this new world. And so from my perspective, although technology and infrastructure is key to development and can empower, it also can disempower. And social exclusion happens when technology concentrates wealth, reduces jobs and enables control of society. Ecological exclusion happens when technology enables the rapid extraction of resources and the expulsion of waste into the ecosystems. And relational exclusion happens when technology is used to enable socio-ecological exclusion. So when you operationalize inclusive development, you can use the SDGs because they provide you certain goals. You can use principles from human rights or the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, and you can use a net, an array of instruments to enable you to work on social, ecological, and relational inclusiveness. But we live in a world where without policies right now on sustainability, we are moving downwards. If you have some policy, we would perhaps move towards the red line. But if you want to live within the planetary boundaries, then you have to move towards the white space. This is also true for equality. But the problem is that if you really want to live within the planetary boundaries, there's no way you can do that without sharing. And that's the dark green line that I'm showing here. And this basically means that all countries have to adopt very, very different routes to inclusive development. It's not going to be that we can all just copy the industrialized countries and the industrialized countries themselves have to find different rules to achieve their goals. And so in conclusion, I would like to say that inclusive development provides a critical lens to look at the global economy. It calls for social, ecological, and relational inclusiveness. And inclusiveness implies redefining development and going far beyond the GDP context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. And I know that you have done exceptionally well summarizing such a, a body of work into only 30 minutes and I know that people will have many questions so please start thinking of your questions. I have some of my own and some that have been sent in so we'll, we'll start with those while people are thinking. You mentioned just towards the end there about operationalizing inclusive development and you said the SDGs can be a starting point and I'd be interested to know once the SDGs are over 2030, what would you like to see moving forward as our goals and indicators? Of, do you, if you can expand a little bit more around that comment about the SDGs. Um, so the SDGs basically, in my view, on the social issues, they just provide a minimum. So they really talk about let's meet nine zero dollars per person per day and that's really quite low in my view to enable people to escape the poverty trap so i would expect that the next step is to find a level which enables the poor to escape the poverty trap in relation to ecological goals also it has been a little conservative in some cases and i'm expecting that they could also be a little bit more stringent on that so, for example, if we are going to try to talk about, say, the climate change goal, it's focused on linking up with the Paris Agreement. Now, the Paris Agreement talks about achieving a two degree target and, if possible, a 1.5 degree target. But the question is, how much closer can we get to 1.5 and can we get below that, if possible, because it reduces the risks to people. And ultimately, I think what we need to go towards is a system of global constitutionalism. We need a system of global rule of law where no country is above the law, no bank is above the law, and a system where we are all trying to live and share this one planet. Thank you. We've also got a question about innovation, specifically around inclusive development. So 
have you come across any innovative tools that people have been using to foster and strengthen inclusive development? So I can give you two recent examples, possibly. The first is the health impact assessment. Now, this is a tool that can be used to assess whether new projects or programs are going to have a negative impact on people's health. So, for example, if you're designing urban transport infrastructure and you look, you do a health impact assessment of that, it might help you come to the conclusion that it's much smarter to have urban transport that focuses on public transport and cycle paths rather than private cars because of the health reason. Forget about the reason with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. So that's one possible instrument. The other instrument that has become, I think, much more common, especially during COVID-19, is that we realize that when we organize international conferences online, we can suddenly make it available to people from all over the world. So they just need to have access to a place where they can tune into or use the Wi-Fi to listen to lectures. So for example, education could perhaps become much more inclusive through this process or conferences could become inclusive through this process. So I think there are these two types of innovations that may be important. Other innovations are also there in the health area. But as I mentioned earlier, one is also nervous about whether if you have health apps that might also lead to more control and loss of privacy. Thank you. You, um, you touched early on in your presentation about ecosystem services, and then there was a concept that you preferred, I think it was nature, nature and people. And I'm thinking about the green economy. And the concept of green econ economy tries to put a value on the environment. So could you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this concept and if it's helpful or if it's actually like at, at odds at what you were suggesting there? So the reason why the, the community of scientists working on ecosystem services dumped the concept and moved towards nature's contributions to people was precisely because they wanted to move away from the idea that you can commodify nature and that you can privatize it and make it subject to the market. So this is one of the reasons why nature's contributions to people is used as an alternative concept. But to come back to the idea of the green economy, a lot of environmentalists feel very strongly that the green economy term will enable them to focus and talk to industry and governments and to find a way of living within planetary boundaries. So basically what they say is that we can move from the take from nature, dump into nature society, to a circular economy where we reuse, recycle all our resources ad infinitum. So that's basically where you're going to with the green economy. The problem is energy cannot be recycled. So you always need new types of inputs and you will always have some degree of waste in energy. If you look at the food system, again, in the food system, there's only a partial reuse and recycle possible. And then suppose I'm trying to recycle a metal, then if the metal is pure, I could recycle it quite a few times. But let's just take a beer can. It's made up of many different metals. Recycling that is much more difficult. So there are limits to a circular economy. This does not mean that I'm against the circular economy. I'm saying you can have a circular economy, but there are limits to it. But the biggest problem with the green economy is that even so on the one hand, people might just say, OK, we will just integrate a few ideas of greenness into our story through the polluter pays principle. Or they would go all the way and say, OK, I'm going to go to a circular production process. So you could have this whole spectrum. But even so, the issue over here is they don't take into account whether people can afford it. So here, the affordability of people is the issue. So the social aspects are not taken into account in the green economy. And the problem that we are seeing is that the green economy is trying to focus on commodifying nature. And commodifying nature basically means you're taking it away. So it's basically leading to 
nature grabbing, if you like, from people who had access to free nature. And I think one of the key easiest examples to show you is seeds. Seeds are from nature. So farmers used to grow plants. Then the plants would uh, create new seeds. And then there would be a recycling process that traditional farmers used. Today, through all kinds of engineering processes, geoengineering processes, we have all these special seeds. And now those seeds you have to buy in the open market. So this basically takes away the free seeds of nature and privatizes it. And that's a problem. So from a social issue, there's a challenge as well as from an ecological perspective. Thank you. So a question from Sandra here, going back to the, the start of your presentation where we were looking at the difference between sustainable development and inclusive development. So Sandra is saying, you know, in her understanding, SDGs is based on inclusiveness, this integration of economy, society and environment. So can you elaborate a little, little bit more on that difference between inclusive development and sustainable development? So when you look at sustainable development, you're trying to do, you're trying to find a way to reconcile social, ecological, and economic issues. And you're trying to come to that midpoint between these three aspects. The problem is that when you try to find the midpoint and some things are valued in monetary terms, there is a sort of a center of gravity that moves towards the monetary side of the equation. So if I give you the example of phasing out fossil fuels, now, if you want to phase out fossil fuels, but you already have an economy where all the transport is using fossil fuels and all the houses are using fossil fuels and you have fossil fuels in your country, then it becomes really difficult to actually phase that out. You could start renewable energy, but that would be a marginal or incremental storyline. This is because of the huge amount of money vested in fossil fuels. Now, in the inclusive development perspective, what we're trying to do is say, yes, we know there's a lot of money there, but we are not going to take the monetary aspects as a starting point. We are going to take other aspects as the starting point to look at the monetary aspects. And you are right, the SDGs do talk about sustainable development goals, but if you read the language of the SDGs, very often it will talk about inclusive and sustainable. If I'm not mistaken, the word sustain inclusive comes out 44 times in that document. So it's really coming out often. And the, the document is the result of a negotiating process between those who wanted inclusiveness and those who wanted sustainable and those who wanted growth. So it's, it's really the result of a negotiation. Fabulous. Thank you. And I hope that answers your question, Sandra, but feel free to ask more if you want more clarification. The next question is from Fred, Freddie, who's on this on this session with us. I'm going to read it out. And if we need to, Freddie, we will unmute you so that you can uh, explore more. So the question is, what is your comment on the integrated landscape approaches? Uh, this is specifically in the context of inclusive development, given that the concepts seem to be permeating the development agencies for inclusiveness. So the integrated landscape approaches, in my view, are a very important step forward. But I just want to say that in the, in the environmental world, we have gone through integration in many different fields. So we started with integrated solid waste management, pesticide management, integrated water resource management, and now it's integrated landscape management. So the, the focus on integration is a logical step forward because all the other fields have already gone towards integration. The question of course is that when you look at integration, do you actually find a way to again, bring all the different issues together and to resolve it in such a manner that you're able to achieve the goals you want? And it could be possible. It depends on how you look at this integration. The risks with integration, for example, in the area of water, is that it became so complex that ultimately it was very difficult for policymakers to actually operationalize and implement. And so in many cases, they ended up going back to prioritization of a few areas in order to be able to achieve their goals. 
in some cases, integration has been a challenge because, again, I'm taking the case of water. When you integrate from the perspective of the water ministry, the question is, how do you get other ministries on board? So it's a political challenge because it tends to take a water-centric perspective. So if you take an integrated landscape approach, it would also be a land oriented perspective. So how do you get everybody else on board with your ideas? Because land is used by everybody. It's used by those who are in the mining uh, fields, it's used by those who are in the water fields, it's used by those who are in the agricultural fields. So to address this problem, we've also reached the, con uh, the discussion of the nexus approach. And the nexus approach basically tries to simplify this whole storyline, but to take a systemic approach, which goes one step further than a, maybe a landscape approach does. Because within a landscape approach, water um, ecosystems, etc., do play a role, but maybe not as big a role as you would want to. But maybe uh, the landscape approach has evolved significantly further than I know. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you for your question, Freddie. The next question from Saeed. There's a couple in here, so I'll read them out. What role can social capital play in inclusive development? And how relational dynamics between people themselves can contribute to social exclusion and inequality, which you mentioned in the slides? So for me, I think it's absolutely vital that we invest in social capital. And if you do invest in social capital, then you have a chance to address relational challenges. But I think one of the key problem points I would like to make over here is that the MDGs talked about reducing poverty by half. And the SDGs talk about completely trying to get rid of extreme poverty. Now, for me, if you really want to empower those who are extremely marginalized, it's very difficult. We had a PhD student who worked on the extremely marginalized people in society. And what you can see with them is that many of them hide. So if they are very sick, they hide from the public. They don't try to participate in processes, even if that is a possibility. So some of the extremely marginalized are invisible. They, and they create the invisibility themselves. Some of them are visible, but they're not able to use the participatory option. So they can come to the meetings, but they don't know exactly how it functions and therefore how to participate effectively. And so this basically means that you have to have much more investment in the extreme poor than you would need to have in, say, the lower middle classes in order to be able to enable them to make equal use of opportunity. So it's not enough to give them equal opportunity. You have to invest much more in their, in their social capital in order to be able to ensure that they can participate in these relational processes. At the same time, you could also focus in, for example, in legal studies, we also look at legal aid where you could try to find representatives who take the views of these people and try to, to market it at different forums, for example, in courts. And we see that a lot in, for example, India where NGOs and uh, pro bono lawyers will take up the causes of the very poor and go to the highest courts of India to negotiate on their behalf and to argue that their human rights have been violated. So in some ways, the social capital is a vital part of the inclusive development storyline, but we are really talking about going beyond equality to providing greater resources for the extreme poor to enable them to participate and also to shape the way society should function. Great, moving to a political question now. How can inclusive development minimize patronage politics? This is really difficult because a lot of the current strategies to help the poor is using pro-poor policies. And as I said in my presentation, I feel that pro-poor policies often hide pro-rich strategies. And uh, there's a lot of political power behind the way society is structured. So for me, a very important part 
of inclusive development is to fight for tax justice. We do need much greater taxes on the rich and the powerful in order to be able to empower the state in order to make accountable states and states that are able to provide public services to people. So street lights, roads, uh, public transport, uh, public health care, access to drinking water and sanitation services, and not only based on the principle of cost recovery. So these services should be provided because it's important for the society. And that's really important. Now, a lot of people will come back and say, we hate the state because the state is so corrupt or the state is in the hands of the super rich. And that's true. What you do find is that as states become better and better organized, and as they develop their instruments, they also develop instruments to reduce the corruption within the state. So you have to invest in the state before you're going to get a corruption free or a corruption minimal state. Does it answer your question? I hope so. If not, do come back if you have further questions on that topic. So moving back to economics now and economic thinking, when you talk about redefining development, do you think that it's necessary to rethink the idea of economic growth in the development concept? And what are your views about green capitalism? Uh, for me, it's absolutely essential that we redefine growth. Maybe we need to move towards a way in which we capture both well-being as well as ecosystems. And there are many ideas floating around. Uh, inclusive wealth is a concept that is now being explored at the level of some scientists and UN agencies. But essentially, we have to move from our current way of calculating growth to a different way of calculating growth. The problem is in that transition, it might just end up being that you're suddenly seeing yourself in a system where you can't function within the existing monetary economy. And so therefore, people are really scared that moving away from GDP will lead to an economic disruption that will lead to the collapse of the earth. But I think it's really important that we discuss this. Before we move further, it's also important to realize that I think that in many of the rich countries, we have an ecological and a social footprint that is negative in the sense that we use the resources of other countries and often we also exploit labor in other countries. And so as a consequence, we need to focus much more on changing our production and consumption patterns and consuming less. And I think for developing countries, it's very difficult to take away the idea of growth from them because they see that as the nirvana of, you know, the next step for them to reach out to. And so it's really important to try and focus on how do we improve the quality of life in these countries, the quality of development, rather than focus on the quantity of development. And how to actually work on that is critical. On the issue of green capitalism, I think my, my argument is the same with respect to neoliberal capitalism. Green capitalism will lead to the commodification of nature, will lead to the privatization of nature, will lead to the accumulation of wealth, at the cost of others, it will lead to land grabbing and water grabbing and dispossession, basically, for those who have it. And especially if you look at health aspects, those who control these resources don't care if there is uh, climate change happening, and which will affect the very poorest, and therefore they externalize the impacts on the poor. So I'm not very enthusiastic about green capitalism. Thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions. If people have any, I'm going to throw you a very broad one, but let's, uh, let's, let's see where we go with this. I mean, you could argue that there, there is never, you know, this is a great time for change with the, with the pandemic, with the climate crisis, with growing calls for social justice. And certainly you're very convincing about the need for inclusive development. What, if any, do you think would be some of the barriers and challenges to implementing this, this concept of thinking? The biggest barrier to inclusive development thinking is that it rocks the boat. 
and it rocks the boat for those who are in power and those who are the CEOs of financial enterprises, the large enterprises. I'm not talking about the small ones. So essentially, you will see that they will come together and continuously propose public-private partnerships for things like basic services or public utilities. So I'm afraid that if you really want to change that, you have to get social movements. And the way to get the social movements is essentially to provide the social, I mean, so the social movements are already there. So you already have, for example, from a social perspective, you have the Me Too movement, you have the Black Lives Matter movement, you have the indigenous peoples movements. And if you look at Occupy, that was protest against the financial system that we have today. And then we have, of course, the Fridays for Future, which is the youth movement for climate change and extinction rebellion. And if I look at social movements worldwide, we have thousands of social movements. So these social movements have to gain in momentum and join hands to some extent. But one of the challenges a social movement has is if it cannot translate its irritation with the way current society is organized, with a concrete plan about what needs to happen, if it cannot translate that, then change doesn't happen. And that's the first message, and that's where science can come a, play a role. Scientists can provide each of these movements with concrete plans as to how they can deal with it. So, for example, health impact assessments as a concrete suggestion. Uh, but more than that, what is also clear is that social movements are able to stop things, but they're not always able to promote new things. So we find that social movements are able to go to court and perhaps close down a factory or a fossil fuel firm, a fossil fuel producing firm, but they're unable to actually push for renewables. And so the question is, what are the limits and possibilities of social movements? But I think it's absolutely essential to get social movements out there. And another thing to keep in mind with social movements is that they are really in the lower and middle class arena. They don't always account for the very, very poorest because they don't have the resources. So basically, these social movements must really make a point to uh, represent the poorest. And thinking closer to... Oh, we've got a question just come through. Sorry. You mentioned two innovations, health and digital innovation. So what's the role for inclusive innovation in inclusive development? Does it go beyond the concept of social innovation? Yes. And in fact, there are all kinds of innovations being done by businesses to enable, for example, computers that work on solar energy, that use much less energy than we use so that it's accessible to people in poorer countries. There's all kinds of innovation in how we can transfer money to people without huge amounts of taxes or um, being levied on it. But of course, this can be misused. Huh? So if I'm talking about enabling somebody to um, say participate in a class because they need $5 worth of um, internet access, how do you transfer that money without it getting lost in the ether or in the process? So essentially, we are seeing all kinds of social innovation that enables various groups in society to access various kinds of um, technologies. We also see innovative technologies for handicapped people, for or older people for poorer people. So that's really coming up. And we have a couple of papers on this topic prepared by other people in a special issue that we organized. What was the second part of the question? So it was, what is the role for inclusive innovation in inclusive development? And does it go, go beyond the concept of social innovation? Yes, because it has to also look at the ecological concept. So if you are creating all these different kinds of technologies, how can we do them in such a way that we are also recycling these technologies and reusing the materials so that we are not creating a larger impact on the global environment? 
Fantastic. I'm going to ask one final question as we close. Many of us here are development practitioners, academics, research communicators, and so on. What are the implications for us as development practitioners to think about if we want to embrace inclusive development? So for me, I think it's very important that we try to look at both the social and the ecological aspects at the same time and not to keep them separate. It's been for too long, development practitioners have either focused only on social issues or only on ecological. And so to marry these two concepts is vital. And I think uh, a lot of uh, development practitioners are forced into the narrative of public-private partnerships and and this has to do with the fact that the, the context of neoliberalism is so dominant that it becomes very difficult to question these kinds of approaches. Uh, and it's, it's really important to look at how we can create the evidence base to say that public-private partnerships in water supply don't work as well or in sanitation services or in uh, the creation of public roads for people's use or and and to also think about this not only in the context of the countries of the west but also in the countries of the south where so many people about half the world's population lives on less than five dollars a day so are we really creating a world for the top one percent or are we creating a world for the 99%. And that's something that we need to keep in mind continuously when we think about things like cost recovery for sanitation services. Fantastic. Thank you very much for taking those, all of those very varied questions. And thank you very much for your time today. I know you're very busy. And I'd like to thank all of you who have attended today because there are so many sessions online that you can attend now. And we're really grateful for you engaging in such a lively discussion with Professor Gupta. This recording will be on the EADI website. If you have not already signed up for the EADI newsletter, I would really encourage you to do so because you will find out about other events. And I think we can also link to the special issue that you referred to where there are, where there are papers on this topic. So thank you all very much. And thank you again, uh, some feedback there for you, Professor Gupta, that uh, they loved your presentation. And uh, it was like being in your class all over again. So we're very grateful to bring you all across the world today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.